The ICN2 conference on nutrition in November was a high-level intergovernmental meeting that wanted to have a far-reaching and important consensus for development cooperation, reaching agreement on how to address one of those biggest problems the world is faced with right now, and that is nutrition. Currently, it is viewed as one of the most important components for any successful development effort. The ICN2 conference had presented a unique opportunity to rally for strong political commitments. Tom, with the advantage of some hindsight, where do you see the most important outcome of the conference? I think the most important outcome is that it affirmed the level of high-level political commitment that has been attributed to nutrition over the past, say, particularly seven years, since 2008, since the, what we call the food price crisis. Before that, for the 20-year period before that, or for the period from the last time an international conference on nutrition was held back in 1992, Progress was being made in the sense that with economic growth and income growth, the proportion of the world's people that were hungry was reducing. But there wasn't a specific focus given to nutrition. I think what's different about the last seven years is there is a recognition about how central nutrition is to long-term development. And therefore, it needs additional political and policy focus. And where I see ICN2 is as affirming that and creating, if you like, the platform for the, the next decade where some of the progress that has been made over the past seven years in particular uh, can be built upon. And of course, we start with the basic realization that even though progress has been made in that there is a smaller proportion of the world's population undernourished than before, there are still 800 million people uh, suffering from undernourishment. Uh, and we also have, if you like, on the other side of this equation, a growing problem of overnutrition, of obesity. So nutrition remains central, I think, to a country's development agenda. Now, you mentioned already that there has been quite some progress since the first conference 22 years ago. But has there also been made some progress in terms of quality? not just uh, numbers? Firstly, I think th there's a, a realization about the critical importance of nutrition as an issue. I think there's another aspect of where there's maybe a new insight. There's a much greater focus now on the issue of stunting, a recognition that if a child, uh, particularly up to the age of two, does not get uh, adequate nutrition in that thousand day window, um, there are long-term consequences. And when a country has stunting levels, as indeed many African countries have stunting levels, of between 30 and 50% of its children, that has the most fundamental implications for the long-term economic and social development possibilities for those countries. And I think that's been a recognition at political level which again is qualitatively different than uh, was the case 22 years ago. The ICN2 conference is all about getting political support. Um, does it also provide some help and support in terms of how to get that support? Does it help governments to find resources? A political support is a first precondition, but it's not a sufficient uh, condition uh, to achieve things, to achieve things in terms of significant reduction in, in, in rates as well. There are two other key elements, I think, that have to be in place. Firstly is science, good science. And that's where we have made big progress over the last number of years. Landmark publications like the Lancet <clears throat> series in 2008 and the Lancet series in 2013, they pointed to not only the costs of undernutrition, but what to do about it in very practical terms and showed that a number of direct nutrition interventions has a big payoff. The other dimension here is in terms of uh, the, the science is a recognition that as things that can happen not specifically in direct nutrition interventions, but in other sectors, 
can have a, an important positive impact on nutrition, what's been called now the nutrition sensitive approach. So in other words, in agriculture, how do you produce a cropping mix that will lead to better nutritional outcomes? How do you take nutrition more explicitly into account in your health policy? And then the third aspect, along with the politics and the science that has to go, are the policies. And that's where policies at national level, uh, which bring together key stakeholders of government, the private sector, civil society, and mobilizes practical support at community level and at national level. That's the other critical factor. And aligning then, if you have a national policy in place, then you have the framework for the donors and everyone else to fall in behind it. And I think that's some of the things that I think have been achieved in the scaling up nutrition movement since it was started in 2010, are trying to build in these three principles, the politics, the science, and the, pol and, and the politics, the science, and the policies, the sensible national policies. The ICN2 conference produced 60 recommendations on how to implement the Rome Declaration on Nutrition. And as usual in the development context, there is criticism that commitments lacked binding mechanisms to translate words into concrete action on the ground. From your perspective, what would be the most important thing to do right now? Well, I think there has to be a realization that, uh, you know, where the action really matters is at the country level. And so it's not surprising that in a, a negotiated text with 190 countries or however, you're not going to get down to the level of specifics that, you know, will be relevant at the national level. So here, I think the challenge is translating some of the good general things that are said in the International Declaration into practical change and practical results and practical policies at the country level. And one of the, I think, really, the, 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 the ICN2 was held just after the, the Sun Global Gathering. And that brought together 54 countries of the Sun movement. And what was really noticeable about it, apart from the general affirmation that what is happening here is important, was the learning that was going on between different countries. And so I, I think now, if we really want to make progress, we have to commit to learning from each other between the countries. There are many countries that have made real progress in, in, their, in reducing stunting and in other aspects of nutrition policy over the past 10 years. Would you say that something like a peer pressure could be evolving? I mean, people who set up policies are human beings. They have some pride to be successful. Do you see something like that maybe happening already in between the countries? I think that's a very positive and, and relevant thing to happen. Uh, I was very struck uh, at times in, during the global gathering of the sun in Rome in, in, in November, how representatives of certain countries were able to get up and say, look, this is what we have achieved over a relatively short few period of years. But what was really interesting was they were then able to say, this is how we did it. Unlike 20 years ago, civil society was now part of the conference, which is a, a good development, obviously. But I've heard that there was criticism that lumping the private sector, the businesses together with public good NGOs doesn't really work for all of them because surely they represent very different interests. Well, just to be clear, the, there are within the Sun movement four different networks. Uh, one is indeed a civil society network. One is a business network. And then there is a network of donors and there's a network of countries, if you like, countries themselves. Within the Sun civil society network, these are all uh, civil society organizations who very, by and large, support the objectives of what the Sun movement is about. And there are now about 2,000 organizations involved in this. And I've been struck by the, uh, you know, how, how vibrant this network is. Now, it, it also has to be, to be absolutely acknowledged 
that there are aspects of civil society who are not supportive of science. And uh, they, they have alternative views. And part of the reason why some of them have objections to, to Sun and what is being happening in Sun is because they are suspicious of uh, some of the business organizations who are associated with Sun. So what we, I think we are, what I as, as coordinator, interim coordinator would be very keen to do is to try to keep lines of communication open between the different organizations. Uh, we will be talking shortly in Geneva about something, the whole area of conflicts of interest, how we manage uh, this thing, how if somebody is, is involved in the Sun movement from a business perspective, they have to adhere to certain basic standards and they, they have to make sure that they are not operating in a way which is, is, where, is, con is in conflict to the core objectives. Uh, of the sun. So I think, it, uh, from my own point of view, I would believe strongly that if we are to make real progress in reducing undernutrition, and nutrition, uh, undernutrition, whether it's what we call a hidden hunger, micronutrition deficiency, as well as undernutrition, as well as dealing with obesity, we do need the key stakeholders. We need civil society, the critically important role to play. We need government to set the pitch, if you like, to set the framework within which all our efforts uh, need to, to be channeled. And we certainly, I think, need the private sector and the business community. Where do you see the role of the NGOs when it comes to creating the right kind of pull? What I mean by pull is the fact that nowadays consumers seem to be creating Uh, with their decisions in the supermarkets and so forth, a pull and therefore determine what is actually put into the shelves. Do you think that the NGOs that work together on nutrition issues can do that by themselves to create this right kind of pull? No, I don't think anyone or grouping can do, any, do enough by themselves. And, and here I think we need also to differentiate between which type of countries we're talking about. I mean, The way you frame that question, it sounds to me as if you may be talking about developed countries. Well, yes, they seem to be converging, so maybe at some point in time. Yeah, but I mean, I think some of the challenges that are facing poor countries and the role of NGOs is, quite, is somewhat different than the way maybe you have framed the question. Because there, I think, if we're looking even though there is what's called the double burden in developing countries and you have an increasing problem of overnutrition, obesity, for many developing countries, and certainly the ones that have been the primary focus of the Sun movement, the critical factor remains undernutrition. And NGOs and both here, I, I would say both international and national NGOs, have a key role to play. One, I think, is in the whole advocacy space, the need to make sure that government uh, continues to put adequate attention and priority to nutrition. A second area is holding government to account and holding NGOs and other actors to account as well. And, and thirdly then, because if you are to deal with, with undernutrition, I mean, one of the key factors may in developing countries may be, for example, achieving behavior change uh, among people, and particularly among mothers. And that brings in the whole question of education uh, and how mothers are facilitated to improve, help improve nutrition standards within families. So NGOs in all of this, I think, have an absolutely crucial role to play. And then when you take it back to the wider international level, I do think that NGOs, uh, and I was involved in it very much when I was chief executive of Concern, uh, NGOs have played a really important role in uh, making sure that donor governments uh, have put nutrition up the agenda and that the principles of donors aligning behind the policies, the good, good policies where they exist in developing countries, uh, that is a critically important uh, principle as well. And that's one of the ways in which we can actually make progress. Don't you think that the first world often doesn't have the right kind of blueprints for developing countries? 
You say, yes, undernutrition remains the main problem, but the aspirations of the people to become affluent like the first world are very important. Um, they are set in a way in, into a path. Once they cross an undernutrition threshold, uh, then they go into the wrong direction as well. So wouldn't it be good to look at that as well then? It's essential that we, we pay more attention to this other side of the nutrition question. And, you know, it's, it's perhaps easy to say that in the developed world, uh, governments and people are maybe more aware of some of the risks associated with obesity They may be more aware, it's still not stopping levels of obesity still rising. But what definitely is, is, is concerning is the speed at which obesity levels in developing countries are increasing. I was at a meeting in Ghana, in Accra in Ghana last July, and one whole day was talking about the trends that are happening right across Africa. Uh, in, in terms of obesity. And some of these are very profoundly connected with not just economic changes, but cultural changes. Economically, where people are getting more income, they're changing their eating habits, you know, naturally enough. But they're ch changing those eating habits in a direction of, of a lot more fast food, and which has consequences uh, for obesity levels. And it's also deep cultural things because people say young children in many of these African countries see that it's really fashionable to go and eat in these fast food, food restaurants. So there is a real need for, I would say, government leadership in, in here in some of these countries to say, look, there is a, a, a long term risk here to our, the nutrition status of our society. We don't want to leave one problem of undernutrition and arrive at the other end of the, of the spectrum. And we're going to have to t have policies to manage these things. You were also on a panel at the conference on nutrition accountability. And the Sun Movement includes a donor network which developed a methodology to track financial investments in nutrition. To what extent can the Sun Donor Network be a model when it comes to nutrition accountability for donors in general? I think they've made good progress in that donor network over the past couple of years. They started off by acknowledging that one of the problems they had between themselves was to uh, acknowledge just where, how much money was being spent on nutrition. Um, and what did it actually all add up to? And they put in place systems to, uh, to deal with that. But it's part of a wider question, and the, that wider question is about accountability. Uh, accountability that if you say you're going to do something, do you actually do it? Can we measure what you, have we systems in place to measure what you're say, or say what you said you were going to do? And th I would stress that doesn't just apply to donors. I think it, it certainly does apply to donors, and we've seen over the over the years, over the decades of at times, that big, fine-looking commitments uh, at, made at international conferences are often have often in the past, but been recycling of previous commit, commitments. So we do need to have a basis for real clarity on what uh, is delivered by comparison to what is promised. Now, in that regard. I think one of the really important advances was, and that was at Rome as well in November, was the publication of the first global nutrition report. And that is bringing together, uh, I think, a, a level of authoritative uh, measurements. To sum it up, what is your main recommendation to donors? Do they maybe have to have more nutrition experts within their own um, ranks, or what is your main recommendation? Well, different donors have different priorities, but I think all of them uh, have recognized in the past number of years that nutrition has to be, if you have a long-term developed vision, nutrition has to be there somewhere close to the FL foundation stone for it. And there will be some donors who have who are really showing leadership in this in this field and have given uh, a much greater priority 
uh, to uh, nutrition within their own donor policy. But there's a specific question, uh, you know, facing us later this year. Uh, we as an international community are deciding on the sustainable development goals, that decisions to be taken in New York uh, in uh, September. And that really is attempting to set the development policy agenda, maybe for the next two decades, both at international level and then by working down uh, to try to, you know, translating that to national level. And I, I, I think it's critically important that the insights that we've got over the past number of years about how that nutrition as a foundation stone for development, that that gets reflected in the final decisions on that international agenda and that we build in, put in place a number of nutrition indicators that we, each of us commit to and could measure and if you like, be held accountable to over the coming years. So that would be one very specific uh, a hope and objective that I would have for this year. And I think if that could be achieved, aligned with a continuing uh, political prioritization for our commitment, I think we have the basis for real progress over the next two decades. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.